Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, um, Yura and Ben uh, to talk about uh, actions. In the first half, we'll uh, hear something about flavor. In the second half, about uh, neutron stars. So I leave the um, I leave it to Yura, please. All right. Thank you. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, so as the title says, what I'll talk about is the flavor phenomenology of the QCD axion and the OPS. It's based on these uh, three papers. The two are quite recent. So with uh, Jorge Martin Kamalich, with uh, Maxime Pospelo, Wong was a student at CERN at the time, and Robert Ziegler. So this two will be the quark flavor part. And then the lepton flavor is uh, with Lorenzo Colivi, Diego Edigolo, and Robert Ziegler, which just appeared this morning after uh, a few painful things uh, with the archive. Um, all right, so the motivation is, um, is really simple. So if we have a PNGB, um, the nice thing is that if it's light enough, there is a, this can be a dark matter candidate. So if I just look at the low energy description, I have a coupling of this um, PNGB or ALP in the, uh, the more recent terminology with gluons with uh, photons, so um, so these are, since this is a pseudo-scalar, these are GG tildes. And then there are uh, derivative couplings to the fermionic currents, where um, this coefficient CVCA in general uh, can also have flavor violating couplings. So the goal of uh, my talk is to see what the implications of these flavor violating couplings are. Uh, so first question, is the uh, this flavor changing neutral current experimental probes that are, were built for other things? Do they probe something interesting? And uh, the other question is whether you can improve on uh, search strategies. And in between, I also sprinkle some models uh, so that we have a feel for what this, the values of these couplings could be. All right, so what I'll do is our first part of the talk will be on uh, bounds on the, from the quark FCNCs. The second part of the talk, we'll talk about the uh, lepton flavor violation. So the, in this second part, I'll talk about also the proposal to revamp uh, MEC2 experiment. Um, so we'll call this MEC2 forward. And then I'll show results also in terms of a few models. So the, for the quark, uh, FCNCs are just reinterpret everything in terms of the minimal axi flavor model. And then I have four models for the lepton flavor violating apps where I have to be quite sketchy um, due to time. All right, so the first part, as I said, we'll talk about the quark FCNCs. And here what I'll do is I just assume that I'm talking about the QCD axion which, however, has flavor violating couplings to quarks, all right? So this is the guy that will be interested in solves the strong CB problem, could be a cold dark matter candidate. Uh, and since uh, the mass comes from the um, QCD anomaly, it's basically massless in this flavor violating transitions, all right? So just um, a few more slides of the intro, and it's just uh, that we're all on the same uh, page. So uh, the QCD axion solves the strong CP problem. So what is this thing now? So if I write down uh, Lagrangian, uh, there's, um, if I include all the Lorentz and gauge invariant operators, I can also write this CP violating term in the QCD. So it's just a GG tilde, so it's a topological term. There's a coefficient in front, and let's also put in this loop factor in front. Now the theta itself is not uh, observable, but this uh, combination of theta plus the phases in the quark mass matrix, this is the observable quantity. So this theta bar, since it is, uh, comes from a CP violating term, will induce a neutron um, electric dipole moment of the neutron. Uh, and this will correspond to a theta bar, which is super small, 10 to the minus 10. So that's the strong CP problem. So why is this number so much smaller 
than the order one CP violating phase in the CKM. Uh, well, one solution is that if theta bar is not just a parameter, but it's really a dynamic field that couples to GG tilde, then the QCD potential is CP even, and then you have a minimum at theta bar equals zero. So that's the, the um, axion solution. And there is a, um, there is a ultralight particle that is associated with this. So again, I'm flashing this effective Lagrangian from the low energy standpoint. And what I'll be, uh, so there will be results that I'll be showing. I'll be showing these results in terms of this capital F. So instead of the decay constant of the axion, I will lump in these coefficients and there is an extra factor of two. And so if you want to think about this is just in the limit when these coefficients here are two, these capital Fs are exactly the, uh, the decay constant of the QCD axiom. Uh, so again, the, it obtains the mass from the QCD anomaly. It's very small. This is where we're talking about Fs, which are 10 to the 12 or so, 10 to the 10. So this is way, way smaller than the energy releases in the, in the quark experiments. And then it's a viable dark matter candidate if you are sort of in this uh, regime. So below electron volt 10 to the minus four or so. All right, so let me flash the constraints that you get. So there's, uh, there's many bars here. So, the, um, so what's on the, so the color coding is red, is the, cap, is the constraints from couplings to the vector currents. Blue stuff is coupling to the axial currents. Um, so down here is the mass of the axion, and this is the, um, the uh, this F, so capital F uh, um, coupling constants in GEVs. Um, and there's also a few more lines here just to know, to orient ourselves. So the current bound from uh, cast from the coupling to photons is down here. So, so, we, so first thing to note is that all these experiments, or I should say also this, um, so the more bright a color, solid colors are present bounds and the, the uh, these uh, shaded uh, lighter colors are the future projections. Um, so first of all, you definitely probe interesting parameter space, um, like k to pi a, if you have uh, all the one flavor violating couplings, you're better than cast out, so too touchy. Um, um, the future with IXO is this dashed line, then the supernova cooling uh, bound from coupling to, uh, to uh, nuclei is this uh, solid line. And then the white dwarf cooling when you couple to the electrons is this other solid line, all right? So now what I'll do is I'll go over these uh, classes of constraints. I mean, there's a, a lot of going on, so let me um, split this. So the first, which is the majority of these constraints comes from uh, the uh, two body decays of some sort of transition. So you take one meson and it goes to another meson. All right, so let's look at what's going on here. So at the quark level, the transition is I take one type of quark and I convert it to a different flavor and you speed out the axion. And then uh, there were, um, so I mean this uh, uh, large group of, uh, um, of uh, bounds, there were sort of three things going on. The two body meson decays, uh, which are, you take one uh, pseudoscalar to a different pseudoscalar. So this is sensitive to the vector current. So, this, so it's a bound on this capital F B. And here you can choose any flavor you want, of B, D, K, Pi, or this, uh, this uh, pseudoscalar. Now, the measurement here, it's in principle, this is the same transition as the standard model with a uh, new new bar. It's also invisible. However, the experimental problem is that sometimes the experiment cuts out the QCD axion region, right? Uh, that's quite unfortunate. So Bell did this for all the transitions. So that also means that, for instance, 
when I take a transition to a vector, let's say this would be a rho or k star, which is sensitive to the axial currents, there are, there are no experimental searches, right? So that's quite unfortunate. Um, then there is the other uh, sort of transition, which are two body high prime decays. These are sensitive both to axial and vector. And the most sensitive was this transition here, which for instance would uh, translate to, um, uh, uh, okay, let me not comment. And then in the, the future is you can have a huge improvements. And then we also calculate three body decays, which are sensitive to the axial, but these are not the most stringent ones. All right, so let's look at this again. So there are all these uh, uh, constraints, and I think the thing to note is how well you can improve in the future. For instance, there was this bound lambda b to n a. If you uh, measure b to rho a, you see that you will improve by um, what is this three orders of magnitude in the reach of the the um, in the in the, in the scale of f a, and the reason is that. I mean, the most interesting part was just cut out by the analysis before. So um, this bound here corresponds to a branching ratio b to rho a of only 10 to the minus 2. All right. Oh, so the next thing I'll flash is the constraints from DD bar mixing, uh, or in general, the, the mixing constraints. Uh, so the most uh, constraining one is um, DD bar mixing for FCU uh, transitions. So what we did here is uh, the nice thing is that in all these mixing constraints, you can reliably uh, compute the transition from the axion exchange. So we did, um, so you can use chi chiral perturbation theory to uh, compute KK bar mixing where we went to the next leading order. And you can do an, a very simple operator product expansion for the heavy meson. So here, you have a, a momentum exchange, which is of the order of the heavy quark mass. So this would be 4 GV, uh, which is much less than lambda QCD. So you can do op operator product expansion. Uh, I mean, what you're really just doing is this three level matching to the, to the point operator. Now, um, the, sort of the, the, the nice thing is that now your bounds don't depend on the decay mode of the ARP. So if this was not a QCD axiom, but something else, uh, this, this bound still apply um, as long as you're well below the, let's say a few hundred MeV. Uh, however, uh, in that case, it will be all the other uh, bounds do depend on how the ARP decays. So that's the nice thing. The, uh, there's also a, a flip side, which is that parametrically, these contributions are of dimension six. So you are UV sensitive. So there will be some other, uh, so when you have a full UV model, there will be other contributions to these dimension six operators. And as long as you don't have cancellations with these dimension six operators, then you have a bound on the axion couplings. All right. So. Uh, so the final thing I wanted to flash was this bound from the supernova uh, cooling, so from the neutrino flux. Uh, so there, the um, the transition that um, cools that could have cooled the um, the proton neutron star is the this lambda to neutron plus an emission of the axion. So this is an S to a D transition. Um, now, if uh, the lambda, so the neutron star, this uh, lambda, neutron, proton, and electron are all in the equilibrium. Now, if you had a zero temperature, then you would have full Pauli blocking, and this decays would be forbidden. So <coughs> all, this all relies on the uh, the, what's going on at the boundary of the Fermi surface. So let's say if we look at the non-relativistic limit, this will, will have uh, exponential suppression uh, due to the mass difference. And then there's another factor of the, the mass difference. So when the masses are the same, you don't have a, 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 um, a, a 
you don't have any emission of axions or when temperature goes to zero. And since this is the exponential factor, uh, it depends exponentially on what you choose for this temperature. So the, on the plot, uh, we chose 30 MeV, but if you vary this around, then it's easy to get sort of an order of magnitude uh, change in this uh, bound. So that's the, the um, apart from, okay. So this, this of course, is astrophysics bound, so all the astrophysics problems enter the discussion. All right, so I promise that I also flash a, a model so that we have some uh, benchmark. Uh, all right, so this, so we uh, want to have flavor transitions and sort of a minimal uh, setup is that the, the Pecha Queen symmetry is, is the flavor symmetry or it's part of the flavor symmetry. So what I show here is the minimal axi flavor model where the PQ symmetry is identified with the Frog and Nielsen U1 horizontal. So here I have a bunch of vector-like fermions, these wavy lines that couple to standard model fermions. Uh, they carry this U1 horizontal charge and these uh, dashed lines are the flower fields that obtain a web. And the hierarchy of fermion masses is because in order to talk to the Higgs, you have to go through ch this chain of vector-like fermions. When you integrate out the fermions, which let's say have a mass of lambda f, you'll obtain uh, a factors of phi over lambda f, where x is the difference of the, the charges for the left-handed and the right-handed guys. So, when the web of phi or lambda f is on small parameter epsilon, then you can build up hierarchies if you have different charges here uh, between the left and the right uh, fermions. And the axion is the, um, is the, sits in the phase of the flower field, right? So uh, when you expand this out, you'll get the flavor violating couplings, which will go as the, um, uh, the square roots of the, the, re the relevant masses. If I have an S and a D, this will be a square root. So the geometric mean of the, M, the, the, the uh, D quark mass and the strange quark mass. So these flavor violating couplings are the, sort of the, the signature of the oxy flavor model. But in addition, of course, you have all the flavor diagonal couplings to so electrons, nucleons, photons, and gluons. This is all still there. So I now plot everything uh, in this um, uh, plot where we have the, so the usual thing where I have an axion mass on the, on the x-axis, the photon coupling on the y-axis. Uh, this would be all the other searches are in gray. So this is uh, the situation from, from three and a half years ago. So these are were present bounds there. Uh, the, yellow line was the PDG version of what the QCD axion is in 2016. So there's some band. And then oxyflavon is this brown band. Um, now, um, and this dashed line are uh, different. This is the color coding. They're different uh, for future experiments. Uh, the, so we want to focus on this blue line so the, this is the flavor, uh, the bound from the flavor transition. So it has no sensitivity on the photon coupling, of course. No. Um, the only transition, the, the, the only sensitivity is to the decay constant, which here I converted to the mass of the axion. No? So that's what fixes the mass of the axion. It's not sensitive to the actual mass of the axion, it's only indirectly sensitivity through the, the decay constant. And that was the bound until, um, let's say a month ago, where NA62 improved slightly this bound. So this is this solid line. How well the NA62 will do in the future is this dashed line. So there will be, on the log scale, there will be a quite a big improvement. And now uh, on the top, there's also the the uh, initial theta value that you need in order to get the right relic abundance if the axion relic abundance comes from the misalignment mechanism. So this would be 
theta of, of pi, uh, and then going downward. So you see that we're sort of starting to encroach on the on the interesting uh, region. Uh, so so the we're uh, the NS62 will start entering the the uh, this axion dark matter window um, any day now. All right. So okay. So. Uh, the second part of the talk is the leptonic FCNCs. So here I changed the approach a little bit. So we will not be uh, focused only on the QCD axion, but will allow um, also the non-zero masses. So we'll be talking about ARPS. And here really the main question is that we have these experiments, MEG to mu3e, mu2e, which will accumulate sort of 10 to the 15 to 10 to 17 muons. And you want to compare this with the experiments that were done uh, for uh, searching for um, ARPS, uh, which had 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 muons. Uh, one of them is very old, the other one is quite recent. So now you see we're talking about eight orders of magnitude or so uh, in the amount of muons. So what does this buy? And that's the, <coughs> the upshot is, um, so I tried to explain what these different lines are, but what you want to look at is this gray stuff is the astrophysics constraints. So all the couplings here were set to one. So flavor diagonal, flavor of diagonal were just set to one. The solid lines is what you want to compare, because that's apples to apples comparison. And the, the thick lines are present constraints. So for instance, this Yodidio et al. from 35 years ago is this, look at the solid line. No? It's already above the astrophysics bounds. And this MEG2 forward uh, experiment that I'll talk about will be able to push this by another order of magnitude or so. Uh, the mu to three online will be a different uh, experiment that also cover, which will also improve by an order of magnitude. And then you'll also be able to go a bit higher in the uh, mass range. All right, so let's look at what uh, these experiments are. So they're sort of fall into two categories. In both cases, you're searching for uh, an energy line in the positron. So the transition is you take a mu plus, goes to a positron and an axion or an ARP, and then depending on where you are, so let's say this would be the standard model uh, background, mu to E nu nu bar. When you have a polarized muon, which is the experimental situation, so you stop the, polar, the, the muon, it's uh, uh, extremely well polarized, and then you look in the forward region, so opposite to the polarization, this is theta E is the direction of where you your positron is going. This uh, solid line is the exact forward region. So you see that the standard model um, disappears at the end point where you would have a QCD axion, so mass of zero. Or if you have an ARP, let's say uh, some 40 MeV, 60 MeV, the line would appear on top of this standard model background. So you would be doing a line search. If you go away from the forward region, uh, so for let's say cosine theta e of 0.8 or 0.6, the, um, the um, standard model does not go to zero even at the end point. So that's one approach is you use these uh, polarized muons and then you look at the forward region. Or the other approach is that you don't suppress the standard model, you don't go to the forward region and you just uh, uh, take um, a much bigger uh, sample of uh, decays. In that case, you don't suppress the standard model. However, you also are sensitive to both right-handed and left-handed ARPs. So in the previous case, you're only sensitive to the right-handed couplings. All right, so here comes our proposal. So MEC2 is a uh, uh, experimented PSI, which is designed to search for mu to e gamma transition. Uh, and we um, claim that it can be repurposed for the uh, ARP search. We call this MEC2 forward. 
So the nice thing is it already has polarized muons. So we'll take advantage of this. And what you want to do is place an uh, electric, electromagnetic calorimeter downstream from the stopping uh, muon target, the stopping target for muons, about uh, a meter and a half downstream with a reasonably small uh, diameter so that you are mostly in the forward uh, regime. The, um, the, so this is relatively easy, you know, you just push, uh, uh, so that's the situation now. There's already a, a detector there, which is used for uh, background rejection. That's not what you want. You'll have to replace it with a better ele electromagnetic calorimeter. That's it as far as the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the detector is concerned. The, um, the bigger uh, issue is that you need to reconfigure the magnetic field. Now, so you could just switch it off. This would be uh, the most conservative projection. So you have no magnetic focusing or you can try to reconfigure the magnetic field in such a way that you have more forward uh, uh, positrons hitting the target. And then you let's say uh, what was achieved uh, 35 years ago is the focusing of 100. So this, uh, just talking to Mexican people, would be achievable. And we'll see that you get interesting reach with two weeks of running. Uh, I have a footnote here. So the projections were done with present uh, capabilities, 10 to the 8 muons. So it, uh, let's say two days ago, uh, at the PVC workshop, um, the uh, MEC2 people uh, explained that they have simulations where they can easily increase this 10 to, the, to 10 to the 10 muons just by reconfiguring the uh, beam lines. So how the magnetic field uh, transport the muons. So you're at so five you minutes or less. What I'm showing. All right, so that's huh? around five minutes. Ah, yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm relatively on time. Uh, so that's these two um, projections that they have. So make two forward with F equal one and make two, two forward with focusing of 100. Uh, and now I should comment on the other line. So this is for, um, so we're comparing here um, the ARP that has both left-handed and right-handed currents. So just let's say vectorial couplings. If you only have left-handed couplings is this uh, dashed line and small dotted line is if you only have uh, left-handed couplings. So this is right-handed, left-handed and both and you want to compare the solid lines to each other. Now, there also have, I also had this mu 3 e online. So this is um, the projection from the mu 3 e experiment, which searches for mu, a muon to three, so electron, positron, um, uh, plus an electron pair. Um, and there you would just, you look for the Michel, so you look for a line on the Michel spectrum and they have, uh, uh, they will have um, an online event construction reconstruction with uh, FGPAs that will keep part of the information so that you can do this search. So the, 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 the problem there is the data stream, how much data you can uh, put on tapes. And they have, uh, they have uh, reduced the event to the extent that they can put everything on tape that is needed for this search. All right. And then um, also flashing the timeline. So MEC2 forward would be at the end of uh, MEC2 probably. And this would be before this mu 3 e phase one. Uh, so sort of it's comparable in what you want to do. Um, oh, I was also had these uh, blobs with astrophysics bound. So what we did here is we um, extended the analysis to non-zero masses and the flavor violating case. So coupling to the electrons, the muons, and mu 2 e There was also a Graham at company had these uh, couplings to muons, and these were these uh, blobs. So white dwarf cooling, uh, then uh, the red giant cooling takes over at higher masses. This is all couplings to electrons. This is supernova bound. And if you switch off the electron, but only have muons, Couplings, you would, you would sit somewhere there. All right, so that's as much as I can comment, unfortunately. So one question is, um, 
where is uh, the region where this could be a dark matter candidate and sort of a completely idiotic uh, constraint that you need to uh, satisfy is that you should not decay before uh, the, uh, the universe, um, so before the lifetime of the universe. So just requiring that you don't decay before Hubble time, which we know is super conservative, uh, pushes me into uh, um, the 10 kV regime or smaller. All right, so. If you see this in at Mach 2, uh, it has to be an IP which has a mass of less than 10 kV. In fact, if you just look at the extra galactic background light, you'll see that it has to be less than 100 electron volts. So this is in this, uh, so I'm um, shading away these two regions, these are these two constraints. And then you can ask where would you uh, have, let's say, um, uh, the right relic abundance, if I have um, the QCD-like ARP, uh, or if, uh, so that I have um, a thermal uh, mass contribution, or if I fix the mass to not have the thermal contribution. So these are these two lines, sort of two examples. And you see that uh, A, there are many other experiments that will probe this, interesting uh, regions of parameter space, but with this flavor of violating um, transition, you're sort of probing the, the region where you don't have uh, much sensitivity from the rest. So it's sort of, okay, it's nice, but you once you see it, you it will be hard to know whether you're seeing a dark matter or not, unless maybe these dielectric stacks push forward and so on. All right, so uh, I have three slides, I think, so the, I wanted to show the, the models. So what we did is we looked at uh, four models where you have uh, enhanced lepton flavor violation, but uh, suppressed quark flavor violation. So the first one is lepton flavor violating QCD axion. So what you do here is you just put the flavor structure externally by hand. So you assume that there's no flavor violation in the, in the quark sector. Uh, then there is lepton flavor rating oxyflavon. So this is more uh, natural because if PQ symmetry is part of an SU2 cross U1, so U2 flavor symmetry, then the, um, the flavor transitions with quarks are naturally suppressed because you pay a suppression due to the CKM. You always have to go through the third generation to have the, the flavor violation. And this is much less of a penalty for the leptons. So in this case, the K to pi A becomes less uh, important. And you, you would first see it in the lepton flavor transition. Then there's the leptonic family where we took the U1 uh, horizontal, the frogat nielsen uh, setup, and you just split the, uh, the two. So it's, it's two, there's separately U1 for for quarks and separately for flavors. And all you need is that this FA for quarks is bigger. And finally, you also looked at the myron, where you, that's a PNGB of the spontaneously breaking lepton number. So what I do is I just show how things shift around uh, within this model, because now I have um, a relation between flavor conserving and flavor violating probes, and we wanna see uh, where you see it. So I just flash, let's say, this lepton flavor violated QCD axion. There's still freedom as to what, where um, the flavor relation comes from. So it's, it's mostly from right handed uh, rotations. That's this left plot. If it's from left handed, it's the right plot. And what you want to look at is so all these other constraints are couplings, are due to couplings to the photon. Here again, I converted the constraint on FA to the mass of the, uh, the QCD axion. And the better the experiment, the further to the left you are. So this is mu to EA present constraint from UDD at R, so 35 years old. This is less than the white dwarf cooling. And then you would be able to uh, probe new parameter space with these two uh, new MEC2 forward or mu 3 e transition. If you have left-handed uh, couplings mostly, 
the big difference is that this MEC2 forward is completely irrelevant and you have mu 3 e is the one that will be sensitive. And then uh, leptonic famulon, um, it's another illustration of this fact. So there is an uh, anarchical ansatz or a little bit of hierarchy that you put in the neutrino masses. That's the difference between the two. Uh, the, it corresponds to quite a dra drastic difference in what uh, the couplings of the, of the famulon are. So in here, you have only right-handed couplings are the only ones which are flavor violating and they're suppressed by the ratios of the quark masses. Uh, so the, sorry, the differences of the uh, charges times the quark masses. And as soon as you put in a little bit of hierarchy, you switch on the left-handed couplings and you see that you become much more sensitive with the mu to 3 e just because of that. All right, so that's uh, as far as I was able to, to tell you. Uh, so what did I talk about was the flavor changing nuclear currents. And uh, the main message was that uh, if these off-diagonal couplings are sizable, then you are probing uh, an interesting region of, of parameter space. Um, from the experimental side, I think it's very important that many of these transitions which can uh, be important were, were not searched for but could be easily searched for at a, a number of experiments and then uh, the last thing was uh, i advocated for this revamping of mac2 uh, detector where uh, you would have a mac2 forward phase and you would uh, be able to reach well above the, the astrophysical bounds with this new experiment all right thank you Right, thank you very much, Jure, for this nice overview. So there's time for some questions. So, uh, Keisuke. I have a question. So you mentioned Myron. So that, that really leads to the left and free violation in charge sector? Yes. By, by Myron, you mean the... Uh, so you mentioned Myron. Yeah, uh, so this is, I think I put in the, the Myron slide. Um, all right, so this, so what we did here, now maybe I can just uh, go over this. So uh, we looked at this low energy CISOL versions where you can enhance the uh, Myron couplings because they come with Y, Y, uh, Y new, Y new dagger why the neutrino masses are suppressed by U1 because they come with the Y new, Y new transpose. And that's where, uh, so that's the, the, the upshot now. So you have um, U to 3 E would do much better than anything else. Was this the question or maybe? Uh, I never thought that it's suppressed because of a small neutrino mass. Uh, I wonder what, yeah, why so it's of course, that. you need to go to a specific version of it. Ah, okay, okay, ah, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, yeah, if you just do the, the high uh, uh, scarcity, so you will never see it. But for this, the, the stuff that was cooked for the LHC uh, neutrino mass, uh, 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 <laughs> so the low energy seesaw, the T. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So maybe I have a question. If you go in the action effective Lagrangian at the beginning, mm -hmm. so you assume uh, real couplings. Yeah, that's true. I, I, we the, just set them to, to zero. I, I mean, was two wondering phases if are zero. People did uh, some systematic studies to, for, towards CP violating observables. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the formulas that are in the paper, actually, we took care that they are, okay, I should say for the quarks, no? We took yeah. care that they are, uh, everything is kept, so the phases are kept. But when we plot the things, we ignore the phases. Um, there is one, okay, yeah, when we plot things, when there's a table, the song tables. <laughs> For KK bar mixing is crucial what you assume for the phase. You know? mm -hmm. um, and then there are two choices. 
So either you contribute to Epsilon K or you don't. Um, and it's a huge difference, of course. No? Uh, and in fact, so if, all right, so if uh, you have a, a, um, a phase which is uh, 45 degrees, so once you square it is 90 degrees, so it con uh, contributes maximally to the uh, epsilon k. Um, actually, it's, uh, this is not even correct. So I need to fine tune it so that it's really maximal uh, compared to the standard model. Uh, then the bound is a bit better uh, than this k to pi a. Uh, but has this UV sensitivity that the uh, K to pi A doesn't have. So if, if A is an axion, QCD axion, you know what the decays are. You know? So that's why this is um, so more model independent. But the, the, bound the KK bar mixing is UV sensitive. You know? It's going to but be... It's more stringent, a little bit more stringent. Than this one. But not, uh, I mean, it's the same order of magnitude. It's not going to change. Uh, yeah, I think it's a factor of a few more. Okay. Um, maybe four scenarios. I don't remember exactly. But we decided not to put it because of the UV sensitivity. But it's this very, I mean, it is very interesting. Mm -hmm. but, um, right. Thank you very much. So I guess if there are no other questions, we switch.